Everybody. Welcome. Listen, we're excited. You're here with Generate Nation and we're jumping into Gen Talks. And I can't wait because it's a great time when we have these conversations together about real stuff with real people about real issues. And today we're going to be having the conversation with none other than Emmanuel Acho, the author of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. I've got this book right here. We went through it. Yeah. It's an awesome book. It's a New York Times bestseller. New York Times bestseller. He's got over 81 million views on YouTube doing a good work bringing people together. Let's get ready for the night. Okay, so what we'll do is we're going to have a conversation with Emmanuel. He's going to drop some knowledge on us. And then we're going to go into our breakout sessions where you will talk with your group about a question or questions that we pose that you can discuss at that time. If you happen to be watching by yourself, there's still an opportunity for you to engage. So what you can do is you can drop your discussion into the comment section during that time. Yeah, because we're with you. We're going to be there. Uh, we've got a team looking at the comments. So we have your group if you're by yourself, because we want this conversation, not just us having a conversation at you, but having a conversation with you. And let's start that conversation right now. <laughs> Emmanuel, let's go. What's up, bro? It's good to see y'all virtually. Uh, it's good to see y'all. Yeah, hey, absolutely. We want to go ahead and jump in because people are really interested in jumping in and trying to figure out, you know, not only what's going on in our world, but really learning because we're here to learn so we can grow and achieve. And this is a space that we have to do it in. And so we want to jump right in. You know, me and Kanika went through your book real quick. I mean, we couldn't put that <laughs> thing down. And uh, we learned a lot going through it, but we wanted to to share that knowledge. We want you to share that knowledge. And, and really, we wanted to start with, you know, the not only implicit biases, but the 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 black identity, the identity that all of us face. It's a crisis for for everyone, especially Christians. But the black identity, give us some historical framework on why it's been a struggle for black people, whether we're black African-Americans, what, what, what we call ourselves and then and how that's all, all taken place. Man, I got into this conversation um, earlier on this week about not using our identity as a crutch or an excuse. And I said, I don't use history as a crutch, but I use history as a way to help people understand. I use history as a way to explain certain things because when you talk about the black identity, one thing I've learned most recently and been reminded of more than I've learned is like, we're not a monolithic group. Black people, black culture, a black things. It's not like you can't just paint it with a broad brush because like mm -hmm. that's what society has tried to do. It's tried to paint black people with one broad brush. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not how it works. Even Jonathan, you'll, you'll get this because y'all knew me in my most infant years. Probably, oh, yeah. y'all know me probably. <laughs> yeah, I guess y'all know me my whole life, really. So remember, right, black by skin color, but I was Nigerian by culture growing up right. in my household. We was right. eating rice and stew. We were eating goat meat. Uh, you must be a doctor. You must be a lawyer. You must be an engineer. Like that, like that. There you go. <laughs> like, I also think we don't currently do a good enough job of talking about color versus culture, right? Even black people, if I can level with y'all, because I used to be, uh, I used to, you can indict me of doing this as well. I mean, they black, 
but they're not black, black, right? You're right. Like, and like yeah. white people and black people have done this alike. And I've realized what they mean is they're black, but they're not black culture as I see black culture. And I think historically and how it's played a role in the present is we've created this framework of what it means to be black in society. Mm -hmm. And now we're having to rewrite. That. Well, my thing is when it comes to this, the struggle uh, for black people in this particular culture, as it relates to finding our way, you know, a lot of a lot of the problem with with us trying to figure out who we are, black culture, all of those different things, is that we were implanted in a different culture, and we're trying to find our way in the culture. So we're trying to find, we're trying to figure out how can we be successful. In this culture, how can we be looked at as equal in this culture? How can we get the job in this culture? How can we become an owner in this culture? So, so in this culture, where we where it started out with us uh, being marginalized, um, you know, you can actually see it and touch it and taste it. Mm -hmm. th th there it is, right there, to where it's uh, marginalization in a different form. How do we find our way and our identity in that when we're trying to dodge implicit biases, when we're trying to dodge uh, prejudices, when we're trying to dodge all those things yeah. just to be successful in the culture? So before I wrote the book that's in your hand, Uncomfortable Conversations with the Black Man, um, by the grace of God, a New York Times bestseller, um, before I wrote that, I got a text. I got a text from a Black colleague of mine um, who works on TV, and she said, hey, Emmanuel, I don't think it's wise that you do these uncomfortable conversations. I said, why not? She said, white people didn't educate black people how to assimilate into their culture. Why we gotta educate white people how to assimilate into ours? True story, y'all. Um, and I was, and this is an, an, an 14 minutes before I record the first episode, now been seen by over 30 million people. And I said, I'm just gonna go the way God leads. Now, Jonathan, when you said that, it, it instantly elicited a visceral reaction in me. Because I'm like, yo, there was no how to understand white culture for dummies, right? Like after yeah. slavery ended, first off, it took two additional years to find out that slavery ended in some states. But after slavery ended, it was like, okay, black people, you're free. But even more recently than that, after segregation, we just have to figure it out. And what's crazy is there wasn't a pamphlet. There wasn't a, a book. There wasn't a, a educational monologue. It was just, there is going to be repercussions for your actions. Oh, you want to sit on the front row of this bus? Oh, okay, I got something for you for that. Oh, you want to stare at a police officer in their face? Oh, we got something for that. And I think mm -hmm. we, black, we've constantly had to like adjust to the unwritten norms in society, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the crazy part is now that to a degree, our, our white brothers and sisters are getting called out for their ignorance and their insensitivity. We're mistaking cancel culture for accountability. Mm. That's the real thing. Like we're we're in a, we're now in a space where we're mistaking cancel culture. No, it's not can you didn't get canceled. You were held accountable. And I, I think it's hard as a black man, as a black woman, to constantly be navigating a game when the rules are ever changing. And as soon as you think you know how to play it, nope, the rules just changed again. And as soon as you think you know how to play it there, the rules changed again. And that to me is the hardest part of navigating it all. And I think even for us, I mean, my name is Kanika. It is very obvious to some people, you know, they're going to assume what race I am just based on my name. And so when we had our five children, we said we were going to give them resume ready names. Uh, a study shows, so not Kanika, not Jonathan, not Emmanuel Otto's opinion. A study shows that the person with the black sounding name ha is 50% is more unlikely, but definitely not speaking double negatives. Two people with equal resumes, a person with the white sounding name is twice as likely to get the job as the person with the black sounding name or the person called Kanika. So I, I, I want to want equip listeners of that information, but also help my white brothers and sisters out in realizing like, no, it's real. Like, and I've never heard the term resume ready name, but like, <laughs> it's real. But think about how crazy it is that you, Kanika, you, Jonathan, have to, like, you're, you're birthing a child and you're like, wait a second, <laughs> I have to call, I, I have to call them something that will make sure that in 25 years, when they're trying to get a job, 
they mm-hmm. won't face barriers. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, that's the only reason you don't know that is because you ain't married. That's the only reason you don't know that. Because trust me, if you, when you get married, that's one. Of, that's a thing. That's a it's thing. A thing. We, we hear I, I hear women talk about that and they'll like look at it, look at each other. Like once you name your child and they'll say, oh, yeah, that's resume ready right there. Like it's a <laughs> it's a thing because we want to make sure that the kids are positioned for success. And we know that Javante is less likely to get the job than John, even if their resumes They're look exactly, exactly the same. The same. Yeah. So we know those in, implicit biases are, are out there. But we you, you mentioned in your book that implicit biases are. It's not just white people, it's everybody. So what do we have to what do we have to learn to do with those implicit biases that we have when we walk around and we think something automatically just because of what we're looking at? And, and, and give us some ideas on that because it, implicit biases that people dance around, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of dancing. I told them, I told Oprah, I use the acronym denial, spelled D-E-N-I-A-L. Don't even know I am lying. And Mm. so many of us live in denial. We don't even know that we're lying about our own biases, but here's the trick about denial. You can't fix a problem you don't know exists. Mm. And you can't fix a problem you're in denial of the existence of. So even black and white people who are like, oh, I don't see color, I don't see race. Black people, I don't see color, I don't see race. No, 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 you see color. Subconsciously, Mm, subliminally, you see color. And I say, If you can learn something, then you can unlearn something. Mm -hmm. So if you can learn a a bias of some sort, then you can unlearn said bias. So we have to take the tangible, practical steps of choosing to, when we hear a thought in our head, we actively, decisively kill off that thought. Now, the best way to truly do that is through experience and through exposure. That's how you unlearn something. But yeah, if you can learn it, you can unlearn it. And so as I, as I think about bias, bias is learned. So how can we unlearn that? Yeah, and a lot of that is discipleship. You know, you kind of get, dis- you get discipled, not kind of, you get discipled into it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a culture, there's a framework, there is a, it's taught all of those different things. And so that means that you have to get discipled out of it. And that's why we're having this conversation, having this conversation so that, um, not simply because it's Black History Month, not simply because, you know, it's a it's a it's a good talking point for our culture. But as siblings of the kingdom of God, we have to learn how to live in one house and that's his kingdom. And and we have to learn how to do that. And so we have to learn each other in order to do that. I mean, you talked about education and education being so important, important in the starting place, because once you know that the dude has a do-rag on because he wants to put waves in his hair and that doesn't qualify him as a thug. Once you know that that there are certain things that are (laughs) just little things. Bro, let me tell you. So as as you all know, or if y'all don't know, um, the Uncomfortable Conversations, before it was a book, it was a series, and um, it's been viewed by, I think, like 80 or 81 million people. I say that to say I've had a lot of opinions. You know what's crazy? I'm most sensitive to the opinions of Christians because now mm. it's my people, it's my relatives talking to me, right? Like right. I talk to the world, but the opinions of Christians, this is my relatives talking to me. What, what's most frustrating is when I hear Emmanuel, it's not about race, it's about grace. Emmanuel, it's not about skin, it's about sin. We have to understand sin. Sin is playing itself out through skin. Mm-hmm. We have to understand it can both be a sin issue and a skin issue. I recently I put out a video that said, like, here is a cure for racism. And my cure for racism was mandating integration in your life. I submitted that America got it wrong wow. in 1964 when it outlawed segregation. America got it wrong when it outlawed segregation. It should have mandated integration. And it should have mandated integration because when you outlaw segregation, all you do is take words out and put them in parentheses. And a word in parentheses, it still exists. You don't read it out loud. So no whites only still existed in our heads and in our hearts. We just didn't read it out loud. So I say that to say, I I, I put that video out and somebody said, the cure is Jesus. Bro. (laughs) (laughs) Like Jesus uses people. Imagine if the imagine if the enslaved Israelites would have been like, "Chill, Moses. The cure is Jesus." Like, no, no, no. 
The cure is Jesus. Like he uses people. He who knows what is right and doesn't do it, this is sin. So we have right. to understand what is and what isn't right. Because so many people are living in ignorance. So first right. let's open the aperture of your understanding to what isn't right, and then we can dismantle it. So I just have to part there because this is a dialogue that will be digested by believers. And we have to be on one accord of, yes, the cure is Jesus, but Jesus may use you. He may use me. Let's not just tap out and say, nope, the cure is Jesus. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We got to do our part. And that's why I love Jesus says in the book of Matthew, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Right. So he, the, the, so he's not going to he's not going to skip. Uh, the church house to fix uh, the White House. He's not going to skip the church house. And the church house is not the, the building with the four walls, the brick and mortar. It's his people. He works through his people to determine what he's going to do in the culture. Before we move on with this great conversation, I want to have my beautiful wife read this verse to you so we can talk for a bit. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. No male nor female as it relates to the grace of the cross that has come to him, nor Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free man. We are all on the same level playing field because we all had to be chosen. In other words, we're all adopted. We're all adopted uh, into the family of God. We were all on the outside, aliens, once aliens have come in, once enemies of God who have come in by the grace that we received, by the grace that we needed. We couldn't even work our way in because we were so bad. Galatians 2.21 says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness can come through even our works of the law, then Christ died needlessly. And uh, the gospel in and of itself is very abrasive. It lets you know someone had to die for you, all of you, no matter your where you come from, no matter how much money you have, no matter your class, no matter uh, what skin color you are, you needed someone Jesus Christ to die on a cross and take what he took in bearing the weight of the sins of the world so that you can have an opportunity to be a part of his family. And we have to recognize that if we have any thought about ourselves, it is that I am saved by the grace of God and all of us are. Ephesians 1 lets us know that we are chosen, redeemed, adopted, delivered uh, into this family of God. And so we want to treat everyone we want to continue to work at that because it doesn't happen right. overnight but we want to continue to work at recognizing we're all the same in the kingdom of god and we have to operate that way all right let's go to our next session <laughs> want to jump into is systemic racism and in your book um, one of your quotes is we will never achieve a post-racial America as long as the gears of systemic racism continue to churn so can you talk to us about what those gears are and how all of that is playing out right now in our country um, let me put it like this I, I spent my adult years in, in Austin and Austin has a lake Lake Austin and and if you're if you're on a boat it's great, but the problem is there's typically a wake left by the boat as it passes you by. And so while the boat has moved on, the wake from that boat is still affecting those behind it. And that's my example to think about the wake left of slavery. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is that wake and how is it playing a part in systemic racism? Two ways in America historically to acquire wealth, two ways. The first way being property property passed down from generation to generation. That's a primary way to acquire wealth. The secondary way to acquire wealth in America is through education. Not my mm -hmm. opinion, this is facts. But mm -hmm. if after the war, Kanika, um, black people were thrown in redlined areas, redlined areas, they received less housing from banks and therefore they could not be refinanced, et cetera, at a similar rates. So now housing was undermined because of the system of racism. 
But remember, 50% of public school education is funded by property taxes. So mm -hmm. if housing and property was undermined, and the second way to acquire wealth is education, but education is funded by property and property was undermined, that now means that property and education are both undermined. So the two ways to acquire wealth in America, property, education, but both were undermined by a system of racism. So now 2021, we are in theory, very distant from slavery, but what about the wake of slavery? 2021, in theory, we are very distant from segregation in theory, but what about the wake of segregation? What about the systems of racism that are still at play? Invisible systems, albeit at times, but systems nonetheless. It's interesting you say that because one of the things that I hear in my head are all of my white brothers and sisters and my, my white friends saying, what do I do about that? Like, I, I'm not, you know what I mean? And again, this conversation is not is not about, like you've said before, making someone feel guilty or anything like that. We're learning. We're taking this opportunity to learn, to be able to, to go into life with our eyes wide open on different experiences and different backgrounds. But the reality is, is, is many of my white brothers and sisters are just saying, oh, I mean, but I'm here in 2021. I, I didn't create the system. I it wasn't me that did that. I'm I'm not racist. I'm none of that. You know. So so in that feeling of, okay, I hear you. What do we do with that? Firstly, you have to change the system within your home. That I think is a, yeah. that's the first key component. You have to change the system within your home. And so it's a matter of like well, how do I change the systems within my home? And it, 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 for me, it's, it's about diversifying the That's lifestyle. Right. You, you, you will be the most well-intended white believer. But if you live in your white neighborhood and your white cul-de-sac and you go to your predominantly white church and your white school and your white youth league, then you are contributing to the system. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be a passive contribution, instead of an active contribution. But remember, right. it is a contribution nonetheless. So we have to be better about actively trying to dismantle this system, not passively being a part of the system, but actively dismantling. You know what? Maybe I'm gonna go to a different school system. Maybe I'm gonna choose to live in a different neighborhood. Maybe I'm gonna choose to be a part of a different youth league as opposed to just passively participating in the system man that's interesting i mean i'm just feeling like man i gotta move man i gotta i gotta you know all of those different things but you know as it relates to this issue and as it relates to understanding is a lot of times we have to at least think about those areas where we all can get uncomfortable so that we can continue to grow every summer growing up and most christmases growing up my parents would always take us back to nigeria and not like nice city nigeria like the village of Nigeria, like huts and sand dirt roads and people saying pure water, selling pure water on the sides of the streets, water out of bags for those of y'all that don't know. And they took <laughs> us to the villages of Nigeria. True story. They wanted to remind us and educate us on our culture. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was 12 during Christmas and just wanted to stay and play video games in Dallas, Texas, was it the most convenient thing? No. Was it convenient for my parents who had to pay for four to five plane tickets to send their kids all the way back to Nigeria and bring them back? No. But was it for the greater good of our understanding and opening up the aperture of our minds? Yes. So now as an adult, I don't think the American lifestyle is the only way. I understand there's more to life than America. In the same manner, you, you said in, in, in jest what so many people are thinking like, man, you, you want me to inconvenience myself and like have to go to maybe another church every now and then? You, you want me to join another youth league? Yes, it's exactly what I'm saying, because it will pay dividends. Like, it'll pay dividends in the long run. Don't just be a passive participant. Then look up in 60 years and wonder why America hasn't changed, because you didn't do anything to change it. That's why. Well, it's important uh, for, for us to understand that for us as Christians to go forward, for the gospel to go forward, um, it can't be done in a disunified way and, and, and expect that we're doing what God has called us to do. John chapter 17 says, may they be one like we are one. Well, the only way that's going to happen 
with a sin infiltrated culture that comes through the skin that has been uh, making its way in our uh, into our systems and into our homes and into our schools if, if Christians um, are definitely willing to get uncomfortable. I want to take a, a moment just to talk about um, when you talked about redlining, it just kind of reminded me of all of the things that play off of not only just the school systems and the homes, but it turns into food deserts, it turns into lesser opportunities, then it's a pipeline to the to the prison system. And poor health care. And, and poor, poor health care, yeah. poor health, um, all of those different things. Um, even with the coronavirus, you're talking about it's uh, blacks and, and, and Latinos are more adversely affected. Well, really, their health is worse due to the redlining and the positioning and the food deserts and the lack of health care that when they get it, they can't stand against it. Mm -hmm. And so you, even what we're going through now, but really this pipeline um, that was created, you know, with, within the system through the 13th Amendment, creating a loophole so that we can continue to get black men, particularly, into the system, which will allow, allows us to get free labor. Now that we can't do that anymore on the outside, we have to figure out a way to do it on the inside. But what the system has done, and you kind of talked about this, is created that pipeline where 13% of the population is black, but 40% of the jail cell is black. And, and privately owned and funded businesses. And so talk to me about that system and how it's broken uh, not only the homes of black people, but just blacks in general as we try to come out of the blocks. The system was created by a people group who were now shocked with the results of the system that was created by them. Like, right. If right. you ever take a step back, it's like so many of our black brothers and sisters are now byproducts of a system that was created essentially for their detriment. But then it's like, wait a second, why are, are black people in jail at an excessively high rate? Because it all boils back down to essentially money and education. That's what it comes back down to. It, it literally, so many of our issues in life, whether health, whether poverty, which is directly correlated to more ed education, it all boils down to the same thing. And so the, the problem, and, and Kanika, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about, when you talked about um, the health, health is a byproduct typically of wealth mm -hmm. or it's a byproduct <laughs> of education, like straight up, like go to a fast food chain, the burger's $1, but the, but the, but the salad is five. Yeah. Like health is typically a byproduct of wealth. Um, and I was even thinking of something as simple as swimming. I read an article yesterday. And it talked about how swimming pools in the 1920s and 30s, during the bo booming of swimming pools, they were all segregated. And there would typically be one black swimming pool to the four uh, white swimming pools. But then it talked about how after swimming pools were now integrated, um, they white people stopped going to them. So now they had private swimming pools. But here's a problem. Black people couldn't afford private swimming pools. And so there's this misnomer that black people don't like to swim or don't like water when that's not the case. If you don't know how to swim, your children have a 19% chance of knowing how to swim. Studies, not my opinion, not your opinion. So think about how this directly correlates to any other field. If I don't have something, there's likely an 80% chance that those who I raise and nurture don't have it either. So whether you're talking about health, whether you're talking about education, whether you're talking about something as simple as swimming, and now think about all the misnomers about swimming. Black people don't know how to swim. Black women just don't want to get their hair wet. Black men just afraid of, like, think of all these misnomers we've created mm -hmm. solely because segregation existed in this one specific field a hundred years ago and the domino effect it has to present day. That is applicable for just about everything. You said uh, dismantling systemic racism is nothing short of dismantling white supremacy. And the reason why I thought that was important um, is because in order for anyone, whether it's your home or whether it's your, your, your business or whatever it is, you have to put systems in place to create the hierarchy in order to stay in the position that's preferable. Mm -hmm. If you don't have those systems in place, then things can get overrun, things can get out of order, things can be changed. And it's, it's, it's a thing that we have to change uh, starting in the personal, 
moving to our families, cutting through our churches so that it can go through the society. And the problem that we've often had is that the church helped the system progress. Mm. The church helped the system move forward. The church was more cultural than they were Christian. And because that was the case, whether you talk about the apartheid or whether you talk about uh, right here in America, because uh, the, the, the church put wind underneath the wings of the system and didn't protest it and say, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, listen, we're seated in heavenly places. We do things differently here. And until we get that from the church, especially um, like we talked about, uh, Martin Luther King said, uh, when he was writing from a Birmingham prison, if we don't have the white pastor step up and say, no, 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 we're not going to have this because righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Psalm 89, 14 says, and you can't have half of a foundation. We can't shout about one thing and be quiet on mm -hmm. another thing. We can't have half of a foundation in order to build a solid structure. We have to have a, a, a solid, full foundation. And that starts with making sure that we understand we are all equal because once you feel like you're supreme in your mind, you start even inadvertently creating systems to make sure it stays the way you prefer. So I, I just love this, this conversation because it's helping people see. And so we're just gonna keep having it. Listen, before we move on, I wanna have Kanika read a verse and just have a little chat before we go to our next session. In Daniel 1.8, it says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Daniel was unwilling to defile himself. Daniel protested. He said, I know I'm in a foreign land. I know I'm not uh, in, in my homeland, but I'm not willing to separate myself from my faith based on this system and this structure. I'm not willing to go that far. I'm not willing to, to, to deny my faith in what we do uh, simply because of where I am. And we all have to understand as Christians as a whole um, that we are a part of another regime. We're a part of a whole another system. We should never allow this system to make us pull away from what God has called us to do. All Christians should protest disunity. All Christians should protest injustice. All Christians should protest against unrighteousness. And we should protest against it in any realm, just like Daniel did, because we should never deny our faith for our feelings, never, never deny um, uh, the church for the culture. We should never deny righteousness for anything else because God has called us to be seated with him in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6 says we are seated with him in heavenly places, which means we are supposed to operate with another system. And anytime this system, even though that's where we're located, anytime this system disagrees with his system, we ought to do like Daniel and say, we will not defile ourselves. We will not be disunified. We will not be thinking about skin. We will be thinking about how we can win for the kingdom of God. And sometimes that's what we have to do. And all Christians should protest anything that is not connected to the regime that we are really connected to. All right, let's go to our next session. tackle is the black family struggle and in your book you had a quote from Kerry Washington and she said the breakdown of the black community in order to maintain slavery began with the breakdown of the black family men and women were not legally allowed to get married because you couldn't have that kind of love it might get in the way of the economics of slavery your children could be taken from you and literally sold down the river so seeing as this is how our families started in America how has that contributed to the current breakdown of the black family and where do we go from here? Let's go historical context. When we were all in high school and in and, 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 and college to a degree, history could be kind of boring because it didn't seem incredibly applicable, at least not based upon your, 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 your cognitive function at the time. But then you think about it, 1860s, 
marriage between black people is still illegal, right? So putting that in context, our grandparents' grandparents could not be married, right? Just for those who are trying to deduce the math at home, your grandparents' grandparents legally couldn't be married. So they would try to engage in Kanika a broad marriages, right? So the, the husband would try to go see the wife on Wednesdays and Saturdays, the wife, um, as long as his master would permit, as long as he had already fulfilled all the duties to his owner, if you will. As with anything in society, and, 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 and I think Pastor Evan says this a lot, more is caught than is taught. So if we are only five generations removed from marriage being illegal or abroad marriages, then, and more is caught than is taught, then often it doesn't matter what you tell me, it's what I see. I, I remember vividly hearing, your actions speak so loud, I can't hear what you're telling me. So if over the course of history, the depiction of marriage has been fractured, dating back just five generations between the Black family, then we can just see the residual effects. The residual effects. I'm not going to make an excuse, but I will provide an explanation. And mm -hmm. I think that's the pivotal difference is it's not a matter of making an excuse. It's a matter of providing an explanation as to why are a larger demographic of people in this situation and predicament? Because I said this, it's not that black people don't know how to love. That, that, that's an asinine thought that, well, just black people don't know how to commit. No, but so much more is caught than is taught. Personal example, um, I still never drank alcohol to this day. My parents never told me not to. I just never saw my mom and pops doing it growing up. I rarely ever cursed. My parents never said, you should not cuss. No, I just rarely ever <laughs> saw my parents. I like the voice. I, I, just, I, I just rarely ever saw, no, not even rarely. I never heard my parents curse, ever, one time growing up. So more is caught than is taught. So what have we caught over the course of generations? Again, it's not to provide an excuse, but it is to provide an explanation. Yeah, I think that's important that you say it the way that you say it. It's not to provide an excuse, but it's to provide, it, provide an explanation. Um, and then explaining also, you know, I do a lot of men's events. And I always talk about how there's 70% of African-American uh, men who are not in the home. And while there's no excuse, there is an explanation uh, to why that is. It's not because it's innate within, you know, black people just to not want to be. But when you have, like you talked about systemic issues and you have the redlining and you have survival mm -hmm. and you have, you know, the, the, the welfare and, and Section 8 and all of those different things in those communities that gets cut off if the man is in the home, then there is another system that's provided in that lesser opportunity area of survival to keep the man outside of the home because we can't receive our assistance. That it's just right. this, it's just this circle that continues to to proliferate. That let's be real. I'm gonna be real with y'all because y'all are family. I'm not often completely real with everyone in life because I have to put on a presentation. Um, but y'all are family. <laughs> right? Who who do, which black people do we esteem in society? The entertainer, the athlete. That's really who, who we've esteemed in our society. And it's not necessarily our fault, but we esteem people with money. And the fastest way for a black person to earn money in our society is to be an entertainer or an athlete. Um, and so if we have esteemed these people culturally in our society, then we have looked to them as beacons to imitate and emulate. Right, and so right. when you think about the people that we black people are trying to emulate in society, what is the depiction of the household that they're representing? Whereas white people, their wealth, at least in society that's even still uh, 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 proclaimed and uplifted is CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, um, mm. business owners, entrepreneurs. So if this is going to lead to an internal dialogue and an external dialogue, because I've had these thoughts, who are we trying to emulate? Who are we trying to imitate? Because I think that's also a, a big conduit to our current struggles is that what are the, the, the people who we esteem in our society as Black people, our beacons of hope, what is the depiction that we are seeing? And I think that right. can also be a contributing factor to the fracture. If you were to challenge the men right now, based on what you see in our culture, based on the history that you know, but all men 
Uh, what would you say to the black men? What would you say to the to the white men and all those in between as it relates to family? Let's redefine success. Yeah. Right? There's a difference between success and significance. See, I don't really care to be successful. I care to be significant. Because mm. successful success is typically dictated upon money, your external views. But significance is dictated upon internal views. And so we have to within our own and uh, redefining manhood and redefining success is let's be more significant than we ever long to be successful. That's my first point. And then to piggyback off your point, Jonathan, is think of it in the track analogy. We are all running a relay race and you took the baton from your forefathers and you're going to hand it to your children. You don't need to make up the entire stagger in one lap but at least gain some ground. Man, because I don't want people to be so deterred by getting the baton so far behind that they just don't even want to run the race. They just walk off the track. That's right. But at least make up the stagger. 1917, I believe, was the first white billionaire. 2001 was the first black billionaire. So there's still an 84, 85-year stagger just monetarily. But at least make up the race. Yes, we are out roughly, uh, what, two, three, four hundred years behind as far as even when marriage was legalized, we'll call it roughly 200 years, but at least make up the race, make up the stagger. And, and, and then that's, I honestly, that's to my black brothers. And then to my white brothers is don't be passive participants. And mm. I've said this before, but I'll drive this point home is don't simply be well intended, but also make sure you're well acted. Because intentions without actions are in vain. So don't sit there and just go to church and listen to your Sunday sermon, but go back to your white home and your white neighborhood and your white school and think you're doing something. Don't just be passive participants, but actually be active in your actions. Man, I love that. Mm -hmm. Make up the stagger and be active. Do not be passive. And that's what God is calling us all to do. I love this conversation. Let's go. Listen, I think it's important for us all to understand that the enemy attacks the family. You see in Genesis chapter 3, the enemy shows up in Genesis chapter 3. The family, the two became one in Genesis chapter 2. So we didn't have mention of the enemy until the family was formed. And once you have the family, that's what the enemy wants to attack. I want you to keep that in your mind, that the struggles that you're having in your family, the, the things that you're dealing with in your family, the, the lack of commitment that you're feeling about your family is all coming uh, from, from the enemy. He wants to attack those things because that's what he does. But God started over, you see, with Noah, with a family. But the reason why he had to destroy everything was because of destruction in the family. You had uh, the sons of God were having relations uh, with the daughters of men. And you had the, the Nephilim. You had an evil race that was happening in the culture. And that's broken families creating the demise of a broken culture. And then God starts over with a righteous family and then says the same thing to Noah that he said to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Because the goal is the visible manifestation of his image in all the earth. The enemy uses different means. He may use racism. He may use, uh, like we said, the sin through the skin. He may mm -hmm. use um, um, feelings. He may use background. He may use what you didn't learn or what was not caught. But the reality is that we are taught that we are to go ye therefore and make disciples, to manifest his image through our lives and the vehicle that he does that through is the family so dads husbands remember that wives moms remember that you are a part of a bigger kingdom and we all have to do it together all right let's go to our final segment <laughs> book um obviously i feel like there are a lot of things to learn for people that are not people of color but even for us you know we're still learning every day about our history and and how that plays out in society nowadays and um for us we have five children and two 
two of my birth experiences, I feel like I heavily experienced implicit bias. Um, one was I was in labor. Um, my contractions were getting closer and closer together. So three minutes apart, two minutes apart. They told me that they should not get any closer than two minutes apart. Then they were one minute apart, then 30 seconds apart, then no then break no at apart. all. Then no apart. No break. And so Jonathan's in the room I mean, with it me. Was... We're pushing the call button. Every time we push it, they keep saying, oh, well, your nurse is in another room right now. We'll send her in as soon as she as she's done. And I, we were doing and we that are, for... And we're like, hey, no, hey. I mean, because she's... She's rolling off the bed. I mean, just because there, I mean, no, no break. break. It never came down. It just stayed up there. And she's, I mean, you know, kind of screaming, kind of holding. I mean, yeah. so it was a miserable experience. And then finally, his mom had come up to the hospital to bring us food. And when she comes in the room, she says, what is going on? And we tell her we've been calling the nurse. Nothing has happened. Well, she left the room and came back with four people because, you know. <laughs> She did not play. <laughs> but as soon as they got in the room and they checked me out, all of a sudden, everything was, oh, my uh, gosh, I can't believe you're in labor. You know, it was like they, they did not believe what I was saying at all. That was one experience. The other experience was I um, had an epidural, supposedly, but it was not working. I was in extreme pain, and I'm telling them I can still feel everything that's happening. And they're like, are you sure it's pain or is it pressure? Now, this is my third kid. I'm sure I know the difference and, between... And, and, and mind you, yeah, and mind you, she's a physical therapist. So she's medical. She's, you know, all of that. So they finally get the anesthesiologist to come check. Lo and behold, all of the medicine that's supposed to be going into my spinal cord is going onto the bed. But it was like no one really fully believed what I was saying was happening until they saw for themselves that... Yeah. You know, that what I was saying was true. And so um, I thought that was a really um, good point of information that you had in there about like black maternal death and all of those things that happen to black women that a lot of people are not aware of. But I know that I experienced it myself. So um, as we are all still going through these kind of experiences in 2021, um, I thought it was very profound in your book that you said ending racism is not a finish line that we will cross. It is a road we will travel. Mm. So do you mind kind of expounding on that and what exactly you meant by that? Obviously, I, I'm a sports person. I played in the National Football League, and I grew up playing so many different sports. And in sports, there's always one objective, to score a goal, to get a point, to um, cross a, uh, a finish line. But what I've realized is, life doesn't always parallel directly to sports because unlike a game where there is an objective and there is a threshold which you want to cross and it, it's a goal, it's a point, you win. Mm -hmm. Racial equality, it's just a road we have to continue to travel and hopefully we will look back and see how much further we have gone. And, and, and what I want people to understand is like, don't let your inability to do everything keep you from doing anything at all. Because mm -hmm. you can't do everything and we won't be able to do everything. You can't win the game in one shot, but can we get closer and closer and closer? So I, I just want, I, I like to level expectations. And the expectation is simple. We're not gonna get to a point where we say, ta-da, none of us are racist, but maybe we can get to a point where we say, We've gotten closer to racial equality. Man, that's important. I, I, I love it. We appreciate that thought. I mean, you said uh, in your book that we can make a change starting with the person, identifying what have they done in the past, what are they doing currently, what implicit biases may they have, no matter what color they are, um, what prejudices may we have, all of those different things, so that we can personally make a change. Because my dad always said, if you're a messed up person who has a family, you're going to contribute to a messed up family. If you have a messed up family that's a part of a neighborhood, it's going to contribute to a messed up neighborhood. If you got a messed up neighborhood that's part of a church, it's going to contribute to a messed up church. On and on, all the way to the world. So he said, if you want a better world made up of better nations, inhabited by better states, enlightened by better cities, illuminated by better churches, enlightened by better neighborhoods, illuminated by better families, then you have to start by yourself, by becoming a better person. And that's what you just said. This whole conversation was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emmanuel Acho. Thank Acho. you.
Thank y'all. Listen, all of this was an awesome conversation for us to continue to learn, grow, and achieve. That's what we want to do. We wanted to take this opportunity to continue to learn so that we can continue to go forward in what God has called us to do. And that is to go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, of all people, because that's the way that we're going to be seen both now and in eternity. And so it's something that we don't deny, but it's something that comes to submission to the cross and what God has called us to do uh, in our lives. And so we all have to check ourselves. We all have to check ourselves and ask ourselves the question, am I doing what God has called me to do for all people, for his glory and for our good? And so that's what we want to do. All right, Kanika, tell them how they can continue to connect with this conversation and connect with us. So if you enjoyed our talk with Emmanuel Acho today, I highly encourage you to highly. get his book. Like even after reading it, I feel like I need to read it again because it's it's packed with so much information that you will find useful, um, as well as his YouTube series, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, which kicked off this book. You will really enjoy those conversations. You'll see people that you recognize having conversation with him. So that has been great. Absolutely. Um, also, if you want to stay connected with us, with Generate Nation, you can text Generate Me to 484848. All together. Generate me all together. Yes. So that way you can stay informed about um, the events and different things we have coming up and you will get text alerts about those things. We also have our Generate Nation Bible study coming up and here's a little bit more about it. Listen, we can't wait for Bible study. We can't wait to go to the next step because we're going to be talking about relate in the context of relationships, in the context of dating and even marriage. What does God say about being a good man in your relationship and marriage? Or a good woman in your relationship and marriage. Because we want to hold it down for the advancement of his kingdom. It's not just about our happiness. It's first and foremost about our holiness. Okay? And so we can't wait for you to join us March 2nd to kick it off at 8 p.m. I hope you enjoyed the night. I hope you enjoyed this uncomfortable conversations with Emmanuel Acho. Make sure you pick up that book and we can't wait to see you next time. And as we always say in Generate Nation, believe, believe belong, become, become, let's grow. grow.